Well, good morning, Glenridge. Good to have you here. If you're a visitor, welcome here. Just a couple of quick announcements to bring to your attention in your bulletin. A number of dates on the second page there for Awana, Awana leaders, Awana meetings and things that are going on. Now, September 3rd, we're going to do something a little interesting in the fireside room at 6.30. We're going to have a fireside Vespers worship. Now, does anyone know what Vespers mean? No, me neither. Ask Angela. That was one of her words. Essentially, it's a hymn-sing type event, but we called it a Vespers worship night. So that'll be on September 3rd. A couple other things that are going on September 10th. Again, this is all Lord willing. Uh, we're going to have an off-site Sunday morning service at Agape Valley. For those of you who don't know, we do support Agape Valley as a ministry. 392 Kilman Road, uh, set in the short hills. Uh, we will have a regular 10 a.m. service. So instead of having it in this building, which may still not have air conditioning at the time, Agape does. We will meet there, Lord willing, and after a potluck luncheon, so we'll have our morning service, we'll have a potluck lunch. Um, we're going to have uh, some scheduled hay rides. We've got disc golf, tetherball, the soccer field, everything's available to us there to use in the valley until about 3 o'clock or so. Um, so do pray about that and, and do plan to attend. There is a sign-up sheet at the back. To just write down something you can bring to share and whatnot for for the meal. Awana is starting up soon. I believe we start our first official night September 13th, so that's coming up very quickly. Uh, ladies' ministry luncheon is also going on. Ladies' ministry uh, Bible study is going on as well. Uh, men's steak night and turkey shoot coming up at the end of so September. All the information is there in your bulletin, so please take some time to look that over after the service and not when the preacher's speaking. At this time, we'll hand it over to Mike to lead us in our opening hymn. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Bobby. Those of you who were here last week, you mentioned, that you, if you remember that Pastor Bobby made a, a snide remark about me. But it's interesting, I did use the word Bethel because I was on their platform for about 30 years. But I look something up. Spiritually, in the scripture, you know what Bethel means? The house of God. So I think this is Bethel as well, don't you? Anyway, back to our regular programming. <laughs> Let's open our service this morning by singing hymn number 56, Day by Day. And we'll stand to sing.
Dear Heavenly Father, as the words of that hymn rings through our hearts, we pray that day by day, each passing moment, that we find strength in you. And Lord, some of us are suffering. We just thank you. We ask you to continue to give us that strength. Lord, we thank you for this battle here on Glen Ridge Avenue where we can meet with you. We pray this morning that the Holy Spirit will touch each one of our lives so that when we leave here, we can do it living our lives better so that we can live our lives so that people can see Christ in what we do. We ask that you be with the praise team. We ask that you be with Pastor Bobby as he comes to open your words. And Lord, again, we just thank you for being here and being able to gather around your word this morning. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
ask you to stand, please. We're going to have some fun with this song. It's going to take us to another continent.
mind. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on for this morning's offering. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we think of the many blessings that you bestowed upon us, the blessing of music, Lord, we thank you for that. It touches our hearts. But so many blessings when it comes to so many things here in the country that we live in. We thank you. We pray for our country, Lord. But, Lord, we also thank you for the fact that we're allowed to give back to you a portion of what you've given to us. And, Lord, we ask that you will use it here in this place as well as throughout the world. And, again, we thank you for this privilege. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. It's good to see you kids. There's a few of you sprinkled around, I see. So welcome to church today. I'm so glad you're here. How many of you kids are getting excited for back to school? How many parents are excited for back to school? It's coming. <laughs> it is coming. Well, at the Kirsten Academy, um, our back to school tradition before we actually go back to school is that we do our back to school house cleaning. Yes. And uh, we've got a, a, a big list and we're gonna tackle that list. It's going to be an all family adventure. And so as I was preparing for this adventure, um, I was actually reading a prayer about washing windows. I, I probably need the prayer for washing our windows, but I was so interested as I was reading this prayer for washing windows because it reminded me kids of what happens when we come to God's word. When Pastor Bobby's preaching the sermon this morning for all of the people who are here listening, and when we go into disciple land, kids, and we open up our Bible and, and we read the Bible, you know, what God is doing is sometimes he likes to use his word almost like a window or even like a mirror. You know how when you go into the bathroom and the mirror's all foggy from after your shower or something and you wipe away the fog and it's clear? But you don't stand back and say, oh my, what a beautiful glass that is. Or when you wash your windows and get all the dirt that's collected for the entire 12 months since the last time you did it, you don't stand by and say, wow, that glass is just amazing glass. Instead, you look outside and say, wow, I didn't know there were trees there. Now I can see through my window. Or you look in the, in the mirror and you say, wow, ooh, <laughs> great. I don't know what you say. But the purpose of the mirror glass and the purpose of the window glass is to let you see the things that you're supposed to see. And God uses his word like that too, kids, when we study it. Like Pastor Bobby's story about Joseph that goes on and on and on. And it's a great story, but I'm not telling it to you today. You're going to have to ask mom and dad later what happens. But we can sometimes want to look at Joseph's life, for example, or the brother's life. And we can pick out a whole bunch of lessons from his life or from the brother's lives or all of those characters in the Bible. And we can study their lives and say, hmm. I need to be like Joseph because Joseph forgave his brothers. Or, like we talked about last week, I shouldn't be like the brothers who held on to a grudge for so long, or not a grudge, but their sin, and they didn't confess it and all of that. We can look at those lessons. But also, God's word can be like a mirror or like a window. And we can look at the story of Joseph, and God is saying, I want you to look at this story, but see past the story and who I am. Because I want to reveal myself to you in this story about Joseph. And sometimes we just come a little bit too short and we stop and we just look at Joseph or the characters in the story. But God says, my word is more than that too. It's a window. And if you let the Holy Spirit, kids, be your teacher as he wants to be, that's one of his jobs, he can open that window and make it clean and shiny and you will be able to see more of who God is. Or sometimes the Holy Spirit will turn it into a mirror and you'll find yourself looking at yourself and saying, oh, this is what the Holy Spirit is teaching me this time. Because God's word is alive and he wants to teach you kids and grown-ups too, all of us, about who he is. And so I just want to encourage you kids today, when you ask your parents afterwards what Pastor Bobby's sermon was about, ask them because they need to pay attention. See what the Holy Spirit will tell you about who God is. Because he invites you to have a relationship with him. That is amazing. And we're going to talk more about that in Disciple Land if you're joining me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is like a mirror that lets us see a little more of who you are. I pray for the children and the families, the grown-ups, all of us who are here, that you would give us a hunger for your word and a desire to read your word and think about your word, and that your Holy Spirit would open up our eyes so that we can see clearly what it is you want to teach us. We ask that you bless the rest of our morning together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
You know, Angela, I think you missed your calling. You should have been a, in marketing, advertising. Because for a brief moment, I thought, I need to clean the second story windows of my house. And then I heard the on and on joke. And I thought, well, maybe I'll turn this into a much longer sermon series just to, for fun. Ah. On and on and on we go. If you have your Bibles, let's open up to Genesis chapter 44. And we're going to do something that you know I don't like to do. For those of you who, who listen to me preach week in and week out, or as my wife always says, again and again. I don't like to start in the middle of a text, in the middle of a narrative. But we're going to, just for the sake of getting through Genesis, before the end of time. So we're going to jump in in chapter 44, verse 18, and I will give you context. Last week, the brothers have come to buy grain. Simeon has been thrown in prison to test the brothers. The principle, the, the reason for that is Joseph wants to see if they have had any change of heart, any maturity, any, any, any growth in character. The boys go back, he puts the money back in the sack, and they, just to test them again, they go talk to Jacob, the dad, saying, we, we have to come back with Benjamin, and, and, and uh, Jacob says, well, no, still carrying the, the heartache of losing from his perspective to death, his beloved son Joseph. Finally, Judah pleads with his fathers and, and, and says, I'll be a surety, I'll be the guarantee, I'll bring him back to you. They make their way back. They have a wonderful dinner. Joseph invites them in. They admit, listen, we, it, we got the money here. There must be some mistake in the servants. It's okay, it's okay. It's, it's, it's according to God's will. I'm sort of paraphrasing here. They have dinner, and Joseph bestows upon Benjamin just honors and, 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 and just, just really seeks to, to, to raise him up as, as sort of a, the favored guest to, to set up another test. And this time it's, it's to test their loyalty, not just to their own brothers, but to Joseph's brother, the last son of Rachel. So it gives us a little context, and we'll talk a little bit more about the context, leading into what is arguably one of the greatest speeches in the Old Testament. If you're able to, please stand for the public reading of God's word. Beginning in verse 18, chapter 44. They're in the presence of Joseph. The silver cup of Joseph has been found in Benjamin's sack, placed there by Joseph as a test. And now they're going to, Joseph has said, I'm going to take him in as a, as, a, as a slave. And Judah, verse 18, then Judah approached him and said, Oh my Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ear, and do not be angry with your servant, for you are equal to Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? We said to my Lord, we have an old father and a little child of his old age. Now his brother is dead, so he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me, that I may set eyes on him. But we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. You said to your servants, however, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. Thus it came about when we went up to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. Our father, Jacob, said, Go back and buy us a little food. But we said, We cannot go down if our youngest brother is, is, if our youngest brother is with us. Then we will go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely he is torn to pieces. The first time Joseph has heard what his father thinks his fate was. And I have not seen him since. If you take this one also from me and harm befalls him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life. When he sees that the lad is not with us, he will die. Thus your servants will bring the gray hair of your servant, our father, down to Sheol in sorrow. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the lad, a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? For fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father. Then Joseph could not control himself, and before all those who stood by him, and he cried, 
have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now hurry and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen. And you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, and your flocks, and your herds, and all that you have. And there I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come. And you and your household, and all that you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt, and all that you have, brought, that you have seen. And you must hurry and bring my father down here. And then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. And in verse 15, he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Mm. Our Lord in heaven, we thank you again that you are a sovereign God. And behind the curtain of life, we see you orchestrating all of these events. You are truly a majestic and powerful and wonderful God. That even out of the evil and the wickedness of these brothers of Joseph, such good would come out of it. And how can it not testify? How can it not stir our hearts to think of the cross of Christ? And so we thank you now. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence through your Holy Spirit indwelling each of us. Help us this morning. Illuminate the text for us. May we be changed more into the image of Christ than when we first came in this morning. May as we continue to worship you through the ministry of your precious and holy word, may you be glorified and honored. May Christ be magnified. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, choices and changes. No matter how different our lives are, we all face them. We all experience them. Every single one of us, it's undeniable. Every single day, whether we're, whether we're conscious of it or not. Some of them are very simple. They're mundane. The choices we make through the day. Like, what am I going to wear today? What am I going to pack for lunch? What type of plans do I want to make this evening? For me, the answer is simple. After the kids go to bed, I'm going to stay up and party until 2 a.m., which translated into parent ease means about 9.30, I start to nod off and wonder aloud, why would anyone stay up so late? This is stupid. Thereby changing the very choice I made a few hours earlier. But other choices can determine the paths of our lives, the way that they will eventually lead us. They can, they can effectively create a change in us for the good or for the worse. A choice can be like a little small stone in a pond. One choice can ripple out and we're unaware of how it can affect so many around us and have the power to affect a real change in our character which in turn informs our next set of choices. Choices effectively can have some influence on changing our circumstances, and more importantly, they can change our character. Joseph's brothers were facing a choice. In the context leading up to Judah's speech, they had a choice. And the question being asked in the text is, have they been changed over the inter intervening years since Joseph last saw them? 
They've come down to Egypt to buy grain to survive the catastrophic famine that was affecting the entire known world, as described in Genesis 41 and 57. And without realizing it at the time, they've come face to face with the very brother that they chose to betray and sell into slavery because of their envy and jealousy toward him over 20 years earlier, Genesis 37. That choice has hung over the entire narrative and is now reaching its climax. Now Joseph is facing a choice. He's going to test them by giving them the same choice they faced so many years ago. The choice of betraying another brother. Would they, in the case of the, the, the context, Simeon, would they, would they allow Simeon to suffer a fate as a slave in Egypt? Would they allow him uh, to just suffer there as they, as they had done to Joseph? Or would they try to save him? What will they choose to do? Had they been changed? Had they been transformed? Now the text, we didn't read this morning, but again, I want to give the context as we lead up to Joseph's speech. We'll, we'll sort of take up the last few minutes, really, of, of our message this morning. But, but the text doesn't say why Simeon himself was chosen. Maybe in Joseph's mind, he was the least likely brother than the rest of them they would try to save. Maybe because of the events of chapter 40, 34 and, and the threat he and Levi invited upon the family. You can read about that there when, when Simeon and Levi killed Hamor and his son. Maybe because of that, he would be the most readily abandoned by his brothers. We don't know. Don't know if Joseph even, even knew those events happened. But whatever the reason, Joseph orders Simeon to be arrested and in prison in Genesis 20, 42 and 24. Now, now, the rest of the brothers now face a choice. It's a critical choice. The question is, what are they going to do? And to exacerbate the situation, Joseph is just going to kind of put a little more mm, mustard on the test. He's ordering them to bring back their youngest brother, Benjamin, or else don't bother coming back, because the conclusion would be on Joseph's part that they are, in fact, spies. And Simeon would pay the price for their lies. And the question is, how is God going to overcome this new potential threat to the covenant promise of 3 and 15? All of this is going to lead to Judah's speech. So as I said, the, the pledge to protect Benjamin, I said that in the opening, they're, they're going to come back with him. Simeon is going to be saved, so to speak, the test of the silver cup. Had they grown through their experiences? Have they developed godly characters? Have they, have they matured? Have they recognized their past mistakes, their past sins? Are they now capable of making godly choices? Did they have any remorse, any sense of guilt for what they did to Joseph? Now, the point of bringing Benjamin to Joseph was this. Number one, to test their loyalty to the family. Had they grown? To really see if they would even return, first of all, to save Simeon, and to see if Benjamin was truly alive and had not met the same envious fate Joseph had. Number two, to see if they had the capacity to put their family ahead of greed. You know, years earlier, they had no issue with selling off their brother into slavery. Judah, the same Judah of chapter uh, 40, 44 and verse 18 on, where the same Judah 22 years earlier said this. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay hands on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. And the brothers listened to him. So their own flesh, their own brother, was sold off for 20 shekels of silver back in Genesis chapter 37. Joseph also wanted to see if they would be willing to sacrifice themselves to save one another. Would they, would they willingly lay down their lives for a family member? When they discovered the money in their sacks on the return trip home, no doubt it struck the, each of them with a real sense of fear. It looked like they'd stolen the grain. They never, pay, they never paid for it. So not only could Joseph, if they were to return after, after that first trip, Simeon's in prison, going back to Jacob to tell him the events that we've got to bring Benjamin with us, 
Not only could Joseph potentially charge them for being spies, which was the original accusation that they were there, testing them, from their perspective, they could also be charged for theft, which carried the punishment of execution in Egypt at the time. So had they changed? Have they grown? Was there a discernible, definable maturity in, the char in their character that pleased God? Have they developed any sense of obligation toward family unity? Could they, the brothers, now trust Yahweh, the God of their grandfather, great-grandfather, and so on, and their own father? Could they trust Yahweh to protect them if they acted righteously? You know, these are excellent, evaluative questions that we can and we should, in our circumstances, ask ourselves in our own walk with the Lord. You know, as we face choices, we can ask ourselves some of the following questions. Have we truly been changed as a result of the new birth? Do we have that, as the Apostle Paul describes, that, that, that spiritual insight, that spiritual sensitivity to the world that the natural man does not have? That's a good, evaluative question to ask. Do we love the brethren? One of the great, you know, and one of the challenging questions I get is, Pastor, friend, Bobby, I don't know if I'm saved. And one of those evaluative questions the Apostle John uses to measure the reality of our salvation is, do you have a love for the brethren, for family? Have we been transformed in that? Are we consistently progressing day by day, week by week? It's a marathon, loved ones. It's not a sprint. Are we daily, weekly, monthly progressing toward Christ-likeness in the power of his spirit, but through deliberate acts and habits and disciplines that develop those characteristics? For example... Do you pick up your Bible and pray? That's a deliberate act and habit. The Holy Spirit will not magically bring you your Bible through the air. That's not to say he could and God could do that if he so chooses to, but, but it's a greater miracle for us as stubborn as we are to actually pick up our Bible and eventually realize maybe I'm in the Word too much. <laughs> no such thing. That's a deliberate act of discipline. And the Spirit's role in that is to develop our understanding of these truths in his word. Good, evaluative questions to ask ourselves. Do we consider the earthly consequences of how we act? Do, do, we, do we consider the earthly consequences and allow them to negatively influence, maybe even circumvent wise, godly choices that might invite opposition? Are we easily influenced by the power of the air. How do our moments of inaction affect us? Do we weigh our decisions and on the heavenly standards of God's word, or do we compromise to be relevant, to be cultural? There are far too many churches that have abandoned God's word in favor of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a palatable Jesus? Do we weigh our decisions on heavenly standards of God's word? I mean the whole counsel of God's word. Not just the ones we like to pick and choose from. Sing psalms and hymns and praises. Oh, I'm, I'm totally in obedience to that. But the ones that really strip away our natural tendencies that are rooted in, in self and the selfishness and are bent toward this world's systems. Have we truly been delivered from the course of this world in Ephesians 2, 2, which is rooted in the power of the gospel, to be delivered from that? 
We can begin with what could be argued are the most simplest commandments in the New Testament. Someone asked me recently, Bobby, I don't know if I shared this from the pulpit, but I shared this recently. You know, what do you preach on? A non-believer at the gym. It was in the gym, right in the middle of the gym. I said, well, I said, the greatest commandments are these. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And, just as a way of commentary, don't be stupid. <laughs> That's what I preach on. Those are some of the simplest commandments in the New Testament. The entire law is summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 37, 40. The Lord Jesus. Again, some challenging, evaluative questions we should ask ourselves. Do we, as Christians, have a loyalty to one another that surpasses what we see in this world? Not all of us are going to be, uh, we don't all have common interests. I'm sure if I were to say to someone like, Sarah, my dear sister, I'd love to take you golfing. I can hear just by her smile the dread at the potential that I might actually ask her. And well, obviously we don't have all the same common interests, but the spiritual realities of our relationship as family, that transcends what we see in this world. To love the family of God as Judah now sees the last son of Rachel truly one of his brothers? Or is it just lip service? Is this just something we say because we're, you know, church people? While we hold the Bible as the perfect word of God in one hand, do we conveniently ignore parts of the Bible that are somewhat inconvenient? So what do we do? When we face choices that challenge the very nature of our souls and our character, as these brothers are going through. Number one, first of all, don't shrink from those experiences. Because these experiences, these moments in our lives, when we face these choices, have the potential to be tremendous learning experiences. And not only that, according to James, when we go through trials and when we go through these tests and when we go through these moments in time that, that have the power to alter our character into Christ-likeness, you can take those experiences and down the road, someone may come along your path that's going through the exact same situation and you now have that godly, wise experience to give good, righteous counsel. So don't shrink from them. When faced with the potential loss of Benjamin, Judah knows it will break his father. He knows it will kill him. Judah chooses to stand tall. And Judah and Reuben and Levi and, and the rest of the children of Israel, we witness in this text and through their reconciliation in this chapter and in the next you're going to witness this dramatic and demonstrable, and that's the key word, demonstrable change in these brothers that at one time rejected Joseph. By the choices they are making, they're going to learn what the God of their great, of their great grandfather is, is a God who can fulfill his word and will bring good out of evil. It begins uh, just with a 250-mile, two-, three-week trip back to Egypt to see the overseer of Pharaoh's granaries. They've got their brother in tow. And as he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, Genesis 43, 29, 30, his mother's son, he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, May God be gracious to you, my son. This moment was so overwhelmingly emotional. Not just in that he gets to see the son of his mother, 
but that it appears his brothers have been changed and God is orchestrating a change in their hearts and minds. He's so overwhelmed with emotion at both these, these realities of seeing Benjamin, of his own brother, and that his brothers did in fact return, that they did care about Simeon. It forces Joseph to leave so that no one would see him weeping. And the path to reconciliation has now really begun. They've returned for Simeon. They've brought Benjamin. Despite the reluctancy of their father, they brought him. And Judah, of all people, guarantees his own life that he'd bring back Benjamin. It seems as though the boys have passed the test. But this was an initial test. There was loyalty to at least Simeon to put themselves in harm's way for one of their own brothers, so to speak. But what were to happen if they were pressured even further? Did they have a loyalty to Benjamin? Would they be willing to stand up for him when Joseph plants his silver cup in Benjamin's bag? Would they pass that test? Could they make the choice to stand with him? Could they show that type of strength when it's stretched to its absolute limit to the moment that it might snap and break? Because in Joseph's eyes, Benjamin represented him. It represented Joseph, the youngest son. Rachel's other son, who he gives preferential treatment to in his house in Genesis 43, 32 to 34, giving him five times as much of his brother's portion at the feast. He very purposefully sets Benjamin aside as the favored guest. And what do we have but a repeat of 22 years earlier? A favored son. The favored son of Rachel. Would they pass this test? Or would they again envy the youngest brother? Would they again abandon him like they did to Joseph? And Joseph had to be sure. Had they changed? So after the second visit, the brothers begin to make their way back to Canaan, and Joseph sends one of his servants over there to get him and, and charge him with theft in 44 and 4. But they were so convinced of their innocence. And really they were. They were innocent. Because it was Joseph who planted the cup to test them. They said that they, if they had it, they're accused of it. They say, if we have it, the brother who stole it, you can take him, you can execute him. While the rest of them would become Joseph's slaves. But instead, the counteroffer was that the one holding the silver cup would become a slave in Egypt. So a dramatic search of their possessions takes place right on the road. Beginning with the oldest, Reuben, working their way down. And as the suspense builds, and they finally come to Benjamin, the text says in verse 12, the cup was in Benjamin's bag. And all of a sudden, all of their worst fears are being fulfilled right before their eyes. And they realize they're about to lose another son of Rachel the youngest son of their father, Israel. And no doubt, as I said, this is going to kill him. They have lived in the shadow, and there are so many people today that live in the shadow of, of some grief, some guilt. It binds them. It handcuffs them. It weighs them down. I'm reminded of Christian in, in Pilgrim's Progress of carrying that sack. They've lived in the shadow of, of, of their father's grief for 22 years, a grief that they created. And again, to add to it, they, they, they add to that grief by lying about what happened to Joseph. They said he was dead. They, they never actually said it, but they, you come to your own conclusion, Dad, with the blood-stained tunic. And after 22 years, it looks like they're, they're, they're finally, with the loss of Benjamin, they're finally going to crush what's left of Jacob's heart. 
And this loss would be their fault because they pledged to protect the boy, especially Judah, pledging his life for him, 43 and 9. So what are they going to choose to do? As Joseph wonders, have they changed? Or are they still the same treacherous men who betrayed him? The question is, will they establish their own innocence at the expense of Benjamin? Or will they sell him off, sell him out, like they did him so many years ago? And everything in the narrative for the last few chapters since we were introduced to Joseph has been building progressively and progressively. Don't tell me that this is in God's word. It's the greatest piece of literature humankind has ever had because it's divine. It is working to this moment. Don't just read the text. Live the text. Feel the emotion. Realizing you're not Joseph. I'm not Joseph. You're not Judah. I'm not Judah. You're not Jacob. I'm not Jacob. But feel the rawness of life in a dead, dying world. And everything has been building up. 22 years of living, eight chapters of narrative have been leading to the most pivotal point in these men's lives. And the question hangs, will the seed of promise come? Or will these brothers thwart God's plan of redemption? So as Joseph accuses them, it's the same brother who suggested in great irony to sell Judah, or sell Joseph, the same brother Judah who steps forward speaking on their behalf to defend, to protect Rachel's other son. Instead of selling him out, he steps in to save him. And so he begins by declaring a central truth that's found throughout Scripture. He's come to realize that he's a sinner. He's a sinner. He sinned greatly in his life. And he's carried that guilt and shame for 22 years. He confesses it. This, and, and he believes this whole situation was probably God's way of, of, of doling out justice. He believed their past sins were coming back to haunt them since they were so unwilling to show mercy to Joseph. Now God was going to, unho- is going to withhold his mercy from them. Basically, Judah is saying, we deserve this. The wrongs we've committed, they're being repaid to us. Our sins, my sin, has come home to me. Be sure your sin will find you out. And they will be for everyone who does not have Christ. You know, our sin condemns us before a holy God. And one day, God will revisit the sins of the lost. And there will be a reckoning. And there will be a judgment. And there will be a time where he will listen closely. There will be, very soon, there's a time coming where he will withdraw his grace and mercy. And he will withhold it because the sinner has chosen to withhold themselves from God's message of salvation. Romans 2, 5 to 6. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. I stand here this morning confident Resting that my past deeds and all those that I continue to commit as I confess them to God on a daily basis in my walk with him, and I hope you can say the same thing, I can rest knowing that Jesus, the Christ, paid the penalty on the cross. He tasted the penalty. He willingly and obediently and lovingly in all of his humanity and all of his divine nature willingly stepped into the darkness of the wrath of the living God and my deeds were placed upon him there at Calvary were yours or are you storing up 
because of the stubbornness and unrepentant heart that you have as a lost person? Are you storing up for yourself for the day of wrath and the revelation of God's judgment? No one will escape it. And Judah is realizing here in the text he cannot escape what he has done in the past. There will be a reckoning. And so here's a principle that we need to take to heart, confession. And what's been described as one of the, I quote, manliest, if people are offended by that, it ain't, it ain't who I who said it, but I agree with it, manliest, most straightforward speeches ever delivered by any man, end quote. Because it communicated a depth of feeling and sincerity that demonstrated whatever Judah's earlier weaknesses were, quote, he was now a strong man of godly character and compassion, end quote. He had changed. And who facilitated that change? The Lord. It was the Lord who changed him. Selflessly in these verses, in, in, this, in this speech that he gives, he willingly offers himself in Benjamin's place. And, and in almost this surreal, strange turn of events, in the text, it's not so much that Joseph is the salvific picture of Christ. Now it's Judah, of all people. It's Judah who now becomes, in a measure, a type of Christ because he's willing to step into the gap and to give his life for his brother. However, unlike Christ, who had no sin, of course, Judah did. Remember, these are types. These are pictures. Joseph wasn't Jesus. Joseph had failings. They're not described in the text. But to say he had no failing is to make him God. And that's blasphemy. But his testimony is strong in the word of God. Judah, whose testimony is, is quite dramatic in that he sold off his brother, and now he's defending another brother of the same mother, is a testimony of God's transformative work in his life. But it wasn't that long ago, and if you think someone, you know what, I'm too far gone. Maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know what, Bobby, you, 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 that sounds good, but I'm too far gone. Too much sin in my life. It wasn't that long ago that Judah was a man who sold off his brother. You, you think on that for a moment. He married outside the faith, betraying his family by marrying a Canaanite woman back in Genesis 38 and 2. He raised wicked sons that the Lord himself put to death in Genesis 38, 7 and 10. He deeply mistreated his daughter-in-law. So don't tell me you're beyond God's grace. You want another example? How about the one who breathed threats against the church and in the Greek the idea is, is a rabid animal, like, like, like a shark whose eyes have rolled back into its head, just devouring flesh in the ocean. And that man would become one of the greatest apostles of all time, Saul of Tarsus? You are not beyond God's grace. You are not beyond his transformative work. Here in this moment, you see a changed man right on the heels of his confession of sin. He says in verse 34, chapter 44, Now therefore, please, let your servant remain. And he knew what he was saying. He knew what, what position he was placing himself in. Let your servant, let me, Judah, let me remain instead of the lad, a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brother. Here Judah stands, finally chooses to stand with his family and defend them with an undying love. He displays a sacrificial loyalty not only to his brothers but to Rachel's other son. He's now sensitive to his father's love. 
decisively lays down his life for his family, displays a godly wisdom, a godly sensitivity to what's going on around him. In the heat of the moment, when the, you know what, when the chips were down, and where the rubber meets the road, and any other little euphemism I can throw at you, when it was time to walk the walk, he walked the walk. He didn't shrink back. He didn't back down. He didn't try to preserve himself. He stood up. He even recounted his past sin openly, publicly, by mentioning the cover-up of the blood-stained tunic of Joseph, which Joseph is hearing for the first time. And we think in the narrative, how's that going to impact Joseph's decisions on how to treat these brothers? He's hearing it for the first time for the last 22 years. His father believed he was dead. And his brothers conceived the cover-up. But everyone's been changed. Just as miraculous as the change was in Joseph's civil status, his rise to leadership in Egypt, as, as, as miraculous as that was, and it was a great miracle, so is the transformation in the hearts of his brothers. That takes us to another principle, change. They had changed. And that change is clearly evident in the choice Judah makes to give himself up for Benjamin, which is a true signature. That's a true signature of godly leadership. Moses and David, each of these great men of God with all their flaws, were willing to give themselves up for their people. They would intercede for them. Of course, that is, that is perfectly exemplified in the one who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. This man. Descendant of the Lord Jesus. It was Jesus who said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me. Don't ever portray, don't ever picture Jesus as a victim. I hate that. He was no victim. He laid it down of his own accord. John 10, 17, 18. In Joseph's case, God allowed a measure, a measured latitude, a certain level of accommodation of evil which permitted the sons of Israel to betray Joseph in order to set off a chain, a series of events that would ultimately result in their own salvation. And so how does Joseph respond to Judah's great speech? He answers this way. God sent me. The grace in what he says. God sent me before you to preserve you. And, and in, in when he states that, he extends this grace that now lifts off of them the burden of guilt they've carried for 22 years. Are they responsible for their actions? Of course. But it was God who allowed a measure of evil through their choices to ultimately bring about their salvation. Boy, that sounds familiar. God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler of all the land of Egypt. So the father allowed a measure of evil to temporarily be used to accomplish his sovereign will and outflanked it and brought good out of evil. In Joseph's case, the Lord outflanked it. God allowed these brothers to do what he did so he could do what he willed to do. And that was to save them and preserve the proto-evangelium, the gospel promise of Genesis 3 and 15. In the same way, the father allowed a measure of evil during the time of his son's first advent when Jesus first came. Why? 
because it came about that through his will, through all of the evil and unrighteousness and the jealousy and the envy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, 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 and all of those religious leaders because Jesus did not meet their, their idea, their, their preconceived thoughts of a charismatic deliverer like Moses or David. Through all of that envy, through all that hatred, sound familiar, Joseph, his brothers, he allowed all of that and yet was able to outflank it in order to deliver us. To deliver us. It's only God who could take evil and wield it for the purposes of good. And so as the text ends, and we do end here with my final, final thought, it ends in dramatic fashion. Finally, after all of these years, these past few visits, Joseph is finally convinced that God has changed these men. And that's when, in this powerful moment, after the speech of Judah, recognizing they've been changed by the power of God in verse 4, verse 5, he, he reveals himself to them, sends the interpreter away. Remember, there would have been an interpreter between them. But he sends them all away. And now speaking in their language, says it's me, Joseph. And he extends to them a mercy they did not deserve. They didn't deserve it. And yet they received it. And finally, they're reconciled. The choices that the brothers made according to the sovereignty and the providential hand of God give way to changes that would forever alter the trajectory of their lives and establish now a unified family that would form the 12 tribes of Israel. Forever changed. And you see in 45 verses 14 to 15, you see the raw emotion. You can picture it, you can hear it, we're sensitive to it through his spirit into the word. They're weeping on one another. All of that guilt, all that shame, all of that sorrow, all of that heartache, all that sense of rejection, all of that pain. In that moment, God lovingly removes from them as they embrace and hug and kiss and weep over one another, these brothers. You know, that's not normal behavior for men. It really isn't, no matter what era you live in. But they're so overtaken with what God has done. It was God who sent me here. That they, get, they just cannot help but allow the, the dam of their heart, of their emotion to burst open. And that's okay. Take it from an emotional guy. That's okay. So repentant, reunited, reconciled, forgiven, saved. Everything is now finally falling into place for this family. And I just believe it's just a foretaste. With all the pictures of the Old Testament given way into the new and the, the, the understanding we have of the hope, the assurance, the confidence we have of what awaits us, the reunions that we'll have, except we won't be weeping. We'll be rejoicing. And we'll be doing it all, not in the presence of Joseph. Joseph will be with us. And these 12 brothers will be with us. And Moses and David and the Apostle Paul and Peter and John and, and all those disciples who have gone on, Stephen and all of our relatives, all of our friends, all of our family members who have gone on in faith. We'll all taste this reunion together. We will embrace in a divine way. I can't even understand. I can't describe it. But we won't weep. We'll rejoice. So as we live our lives in this world, loved ones, we have choices to make. The first is, what do you do with Jesus? Jesus. That choice will direct your eternal destiny 
It will inform your life today. And it has the power to change you, to free you, to unshackle you from this world and save you from the wrath of God. And that choice, and I use that in quotes, that choice, as the gospel is presented to you. What do you do with this Jesus? Because that choice, so to speak, has the power to change your life for the good or for the worse. You may be at a crossroads in your own life. Where do you stand? Where do you stand with Jesus of Nazareth? Our Lord in heaven, we are just so grateful this morning as we consider Joseph, who was a type of Christ, who shares this great divine truth that as we witness the sufferings of the Lord Jesus, sometimes we wrestle with the whys and the hows, and the, we recognize, according to your word, like in the case of Joseph, it was you who sent him that he willingly took on a body of flesh without sin. The one who knew no sin. And it was totally holy and righteous. The one who chose, so to speak, as we try to grasp and understand the divine counsel of God. The one who came and chose to love on us, to minister to us, to teach us as the word of God, to die in our place, and the one who had the power to lift up his life again. Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus is our Savior and Lord. We thank you for the pictures in the Old Testament that describe him and his ministry, his person. And though each of these men falls short in their humanity, they remind us of how we ought to live our lives, as these are the great examples of the faith. Judah totally transformed, Lord. What a miraculous work. If there's anyone here who has not yet tasted that goodness, that, that sweetness of the gospel, I pray that even in this very moment, in this building or watching online, that they would come to you, confess their sin as Judah did, and have the weight, the burden, the agony, the shame of their sin removed from them and enter into a newness of joy in a relationship with you. And may we be like Joseph when we are wronged, even by the brethren. May we have a love for them that surpasses the natural tendencies of the flesh and extend to them a grace and mercy they do not deserve because we can recognize in ourselves that we did not deserve your grace and mercy. Father, build us up. As you built up the 12 tribes of Israel, continue to build your church here today for your glory. And so as we end, Father, we pray that you would bless again this time, our last hymn, may it be honoring to you. And may we be truly transformed more, not by emotion, but by your spirit through deliberate acts of discipline and extend mercy and grace to all those around us. May we be more like Jesus than when we were just even a moment ago. We pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bobby, for those words this morning. Let's close our service this morning by singing, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, a beautiful hymn. Let's stand up, please.
before we close, I just want to thank Dove for playing, Jill and Danny, Frank, Jurgen, Dave, Kay. I really appreciate that ministry. And I'd like to recognize right now with just a round of applause to thank you for that. As a guy who can play one song on the mandolin, I'm always amazed when you guys go up to the gifting that you have from the Lord. And I'm very, very thankful that you're here to minister and exercise that gift for this congregation. Let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, we just, again, are just in awe. Just in awe of your grace. Just in awe of that amazing grace that despite our own sinfulness and our own stubbornness and our own waywardness and, and really, in a sense, the way we worship ourselves, that you had it in your divine heart to lay down your son's life, that Jesus would lay down his life for us. It's truly a great testimony of, of the width and height and depth and length of your love. And we thank you that though you are a holy God, and there can be no argument with that, you're also a merciful God. We see that manifest in the life of your servant Joseph, who was betrayed in the most intimate of ways by his own family. And through the course of his life, we see your hand guiding him and directing him and encouraging him and blessing him and all those around him despite the difficult circumstances he is in. And it's all to lead to a salvation for his brothers that they are totally unaware of. So we thank you for the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus as we follow him through his 33 years or so of life on the earth and how he was rejected, how he was hatred, how he was betrayed how he was, in a sense, sold off and suffered the agonies of the cross. We see again your hand behind those dark scenes those days many years ago, bringing about a salvation and a redemption that goes beyond description. So we thank you humbly this morning for it. With the praise of our lips, we pray this is accepting in your sight. And Lord, I pray for this congregation that you would continue to bless it, that your face would continue, continue to shine upon it, that your countenance would be lifted up. And Lord, that we would just again be sensitive to the leading of your spirit and his transformative work in our lives, that we would hold on to the ties that bind, those eternal binds that are in Christ. So Father, as we depart this place again, it is my prayer that in my heart and in the hearts of all those listening who are truly yours, we'd be more like Jesus than we were just even a moment ago. To your glory we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.